This all started after the third night of vacation Bible school at 1.30 in the morning. I was so restless that I woke up my husband. <laughs> when I told him what was on my mind, we began writing this sermon as we talked. He didn't know we were writing a sermon. Um, I realize that this sermon is going to be strange and weighty one. Um, unfortunately, I'm a little like Jonah on this one. My desire to avoid it was not being accepted by the one who inspired it. I told my pastor that I had a message and expected to speak in January or February because that was the first break in speakers that I saw on the schedule. But no, he decided that the week that my family was out here visiting in Massachusetts for my son's wedding was the perfect time to throw this on me. So I didn't pick the topic and I didn't pick the dates and that kind of led me to banal, which is to me a little bit of a homecoming because uh, in May of 1988, I was baptized right there by my, I am an Orsburn. <laughs> by my grandpa Orsburn. Uh, so when my family came out, Uncle Bill and Aunt Nancy, Uncle Mick and Aunt Judy, all the people who are responsible for keeping me honest, for showing me what love does, and for um, giving me a place where I belong no matter of time and distance, because this is five and a half hours from where I live. It's not very often that I'm out here. So instead, God wouldn't let me sleep on July 31st. So my recommendation is to watch out because when you ask God to give you a message and make you a servant, he never resists that challenge. As Seventh-day Adventists, these days are very tricky. We believe that, that Daniel and the Revelation foretell the end times and the coming events are all preordained. So we feel as though there is nothing for us to do except go to church, maybe do a little friendship evangelism, worship with our family, and send funds to our missionaries to do the work of spreading God's work to the rest of the world. They need our support. It's a noble task. I'm not saying don't send them your money. <laughs> My point is that there is even more. There's something deep inside us that cringes a little bit when we see our nation take another step toward lawlessness, wickedness, losses of freedom, and the coming judgment. We know that we will be forced to stand up at some point, or we will not be with our Father in heaven after his return. But what on earth does that look like in real life? I've always imagined it would be like it was for the apostles, an easy easily identifiable moment for me to take a stand for what I believe, you know, denounce this imposter Jesus. <laughs> or do you actually believe that there's some invisible being in the clouds that is going to save you? To which we can loudly and proudly reply, obviously under threat, with, yes, I believe in my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, my creator and protector. That would be impossible to miss, right? But what if it's slower and less noticeable than, than that? Are we being lulled into complacency and acceptance of what is obviously wrong and not of God? Are we being desensitized slowly without even minding? Are we actually different from the rest of the world? It starts out simple and at a very young age. Children are the best of us. They get scared if something looks not right, or if scary music starts playing in a movie, or if someone does something wrong or unkind. They know instinctively that they should look away and not participate because it's bad. But even they can be tricked by an otherwise sweet story and likable characters, then bam! That part, that bad part, it's always coming. But they don't shut it off because they still need to find out what happened to the good kid, or the puppy, or the princess, whatever the thing is? They bear with the bad because they're interested in the rest. Unfortunately, that curiosity and hope is used against them by the writers and production companies. My granddaughter loves princesses, castles, fairies, mermaids, unicorns, and everything pretty. She hates being scared and makes us skip anything that's remotely not happy. And when I say that, I mean even if she hears, like, there's gonna be a child that gets scolded for what they just did. She runs out of the room. 
She wants no part of evil, but even for her, it's more alluring than she can resist. In order to get to the good parts, there are tons of bad things to be exposed to. It's hidden in the background of the scenery, slipped into the rhythms and lyrics of the music, and yes, even though it's allegedly for children, every princess movie contains an evil witch or creature, right in your face. But there are other sneakier, more discreet dangers too. Those are the things that everybody knows we need to warn our children about. There's gonna be a witch and it's gonna be scary, but as soon as it's over, then all the good things happen. Most of you have heard the song, Let It Go, from the movie Frozen. Once it gets in your head, it just keeps going and going and going. But let's listen to the lyrics right now and see if you notice what message they're trying to give our kids without them noticing, or without us noticing. The snow glows white on the mountain tonight, not a footprint to be seen, a kingdom of isolation, and it looks like I'm the queen. The wind is howling like the storming, swirling storm inside. Couldn't keep it in. Heaven knows I've tried. Don't let them in. Don't let them see. Be the good girl you always have to be. Conceal. Don't feel. Don't let them know. Well, now they know. Let it go. Let it go. Can't hold back anymore. Let it go. Let it go. Turn away and slam the door. I don't care what they're going to say. Let the storm rage on. The cold never bothered me anyway. It's funny how some distances make everything seem real, and the fears that once controlled me can't get to me at all. It's time to see what I can do, test the limits, and break through. No right, no wrong, no rules for me, I'm free. My power flurries through the air, into the ground. My soul is spiraling, frozen fractals all around, and one thought crystallizes like the icy blast. I'm never going pat back the past in the, is in the past. Let it go, let it go, and I'll rise to the break of dawn. Let it go, let it go, that perfect girl is gone. Here I stand in the light of day, let the storm rage on, the cold never bothered me anyway. The movie Frozen is dazzling, beautiful, and enchanting. The music is lively, energetic, even the songs sparkle. But the lyrics are dangerous for young minds. The main character is overcome with magic, which she used to acknowledge was dangerous and could harm others. This is followed by years of locking herself behind a door, never communicating with her sister, who begs her to become a part of her life. And no one else tried to save her. When she finally decided to let go of her old self, she wholly isolates herself in her new ice castle. Her only remaining family is now abandoned and left behind. What kind of message is this for children? Really, if you mess up, lock yourself in your room and ignore the people who love you and want to be a part of your life, they could never understand your pain anyway. When she does this, she's no longer the person she used to be, a beloved daughter, sister, a princess of her father's kingdom. Don't misunderstand me, we must grow and change, but we must not lose the core of who we are or who really loves us. That whole message is terrible for young, malleable minds. In addition to magic, evil, and spiritualism, they're promoting going no contact, which is cutting off those who are closest to you because they can't understand what's going on in your life. But the things are so energetic and beautiful that you don't actually think about the lyrics. So we let our kids watch it because they love to see it all. The whole time they're singing at the age of four and five years old, the subtleties are getting into their subconscious. They sing the lyrics without ever thinking about them until the moment it fits with the turmoil that they're actually experiencing in their young lives when they're teenagers. I know that when I was growing up, if I was worried, afraid, or confused, a hymn would pop into my mind, which was perfect for that moment, every time without fail. What songs are popping into your ch children's mind, to the mind of this generation? Last week, my granddaughter told me about, forgive me for butchering this, Ghibli movies? She watches them with her mom. They're the, they're the celebrated anime production studio that brought us Kiki's Delivery Service and Spirited Away. I've never seen either, but they're all about witches. Um, so she was telling me about how much she liked the last movie that they watched about kids who borrowed things that nobody would notice were missing. 
I said, you mean they were stealing? She said, no. Did they have permission to take those things? No. Did they return them in the same or better condition? No. Why do you think they were borrowing the things they took? Because they said they were borrowing them. I said, then they were lying. She asked why they lied. I said, isn't that a great question? Why are they lying to our kids and confusing them about what is right and true? This is a tactic not used only on young children. Teens are being desensitized as well. After I preached this sermon in Massachusetts, a girl about 15 years old came up and talked to me for quite a while about the video games that she plays. She said the worst one is called, I couldn't remember all of the video games that she mentioned, but the one that did stand out was FNAF, Five Nights at Freddy's. I'll just read you quickly what Wikipedia has to say about it. I'm glad the kids are in church. (laughs) The Five Nights at Freddy's series mainly revolves around a chain of family restaurants under the ownership of Fazbear Entertainment, a company founded by Henry, Emily, and William Afton. Sounds a little like Chuck E. Cheese, no big deal. William is a robotics engineer who creates a series of animatronic mascots to entertain customers, including Freddy Fazbear. William is also a negligent father and child murderer who hides his victims' bodies inside animatronics, which their souls inhabit. He specifically designed Circus Baby to be capable of murdering children, which leads to the accidental death of his own daughter, Elizabeth. William's direct murderer, victims started with his co-worker Henry's daughter and expanded to include five children visiting the restaurants with their families. Meanwhile, an incident involving William's youngest son being shoved into Fred Bear's mouth by his older brother Michael results in a closure of Fred Bear's family diner. After accidentally murdering his brother, Michael begins seeking redemption starting with recovering the remains of his sister. After a closure of Freddy Fazbear's pizza location, William dismantles the remaining animatronics in a back room, releasing the souls from the inhabitant in, that inhabit them, and proceeds to torment him. Seeking ref- refuge from the ghosts, William hides inside the old yellow rabbit animatronic suit. The suit's mechanisms fail and snap shut, crushing William to death as his soul inhabits the animatronic. Sometime after, the whole restaurant change su- shuts down. And that's all I have to say about that. Except, (laughs) our children know and play these games. Our children in our churches. And we're not watching. Think long and hard about how much time your young person has unfettered access to technology. You know that you're responsible for a great deal more than their physical safety. It's not just G.I. Joe anymore where there are no blood and the bad guys parachute out of a jet before it crash. Until recently, I didn't actually believe our nation was led and influenced by true Satanists. I thought my grandma Walker was being hyperbolic when she used to say that the TV was a devil box. We used to make fun of that, (laughs) but she was right. You only need to open your eyes for five minutes of anything before you come across some form of subversive messaging. Hedonism is defined as the doctrinal belief that happiness or pleasure is the only good in life. The surest path to hedonism is the repetition of a lie until it becomes true. If I do not actively watch out for it, we will miss it. And the desensitization, the lie, will sweep us away before we even realize the tide has come in. For the older generation, don't think you're impervious. It's true, Satanism only occasionally showed up as bluntly as it does today. You know, Bob Dylan reportedly sold his soul to the devil. Ozzy Osbourne used to rip the heads off chickens in his mouth. But I'll get to you adults later. The easiest way to show you what our kids today are being faced with would be to put images up on the screens but I respect the sanctity of this house of God, and I cherish our kids who I thought would be sitting in these pews, and I would not subject them to those images. It's so mainstream, though, that I'm certain they're aware of them. And if you think social media is appropriate for young people, or in my opinion, even adults, 
I, I think you're wrong. <laughs> I think you should take a look at what is actually being put on the feed by the app itself. Every time they come across something, it becomes less shocking and more acceptable, more true. An unrealistic self-image to try to live up to, a product that they have, and you have to have it. An idealized and false image of real life or a bad advice from a sponsored influencer. The things which never used to be on TV are now in every show. And things I've never wanted to imagine are everywhere. Take my word for it that at this moment, I'm gonna be minimal in my next descriptions because again, I thought our children were gonna be in this room with us. But I don't wanna bring them any new views or ratings or attention, but for the sake of acknowledging that there is a strong and current attack aimed at our young people, I'll point out a few. There's Billie Eilish who shows blunt satanic worship in the song, All Good Girls Go to Hell which begins with the first line, my Lucifer is lonely. But I assure you that the video continues to be horrifyingly dumb, demonic. There's Lil Nas, Lil Nas, I'm sorry, who marketed shoes with human blood in the soles. I don't know anything else about him, but he's known to our young people. There was Sam Smith's Grammy performance, was, which was not even the first time that the Grammys had Satanism on full display for all of us to see. But the most popular and most mislabeled musician of this generation, in my opinion, is Taylor Swift. She is revered and praised as sweet and wholesome in the media and really everywhere. She recently released a video with Ice Spice called Karma, which is not even subtle. It openly displays the truth right out there in the light of day. In the images, they reflect satanic worship and they even boldly damn God at least five or six times right in the lyrics. It's simple, just say it like it means nothing. We cannot think that a video where someone is wearing devil horns or dripping in blood is simply making a statement on the judgmentalism and negativity of a religion. It's demonic, pure and simple. It's intended to create a shadow of doubt in the power and truth of God. I beg you, the young people of our church, don't let the de desensitization take hold. Let God take hold. Be strong. Let's say, though, that you're vigilant and you try never to watch movies or TV because you've learned early on that it was a devil box. There are plenty of ways that we're being desensitized anyway. We're overwhelmed and confused with mixed messaging. We're getting inundated with things that are slightly bend our boundaries of what is proper and acceptable by God's standards. I'll admit that I'm not even fully aware of some of the new age ideas that have worked their way into our Christian lives via Christian music, Christian movies, and even creeping into some of our sermons. Things like saying, send the happy thoughts or good vibes your way instead of saying, I'm praying for you. Or nature is my church, which is especially popular along my children's generation. It's a statement of why they don't need to go to a traditional church where they feel judged. It's true that God wants us to spend time in nature in order to feel closer to him. But climbing a rock wall or snowboarding with friends is just you doing what you want to do and admiring the ha his handiwork without acknowledging the presence and truth of God himself. But before I move on from our young people, I'll point out that they're not just texting their friends the way that we used to chat on the phone for hours. Instead, they're losing social skills, emotional resilience, and forgiveness by losing face-to-face -fa -face socialization. They're watching videos of some pretty brutal after-school fights of influencers demonstrating the latest challenge to try out, and of course, Whose day is really complete without listening to someone cry in their car, sharing some new epiphany that they had, which suddenly turned into the most amazing advice and enlightened piece of information that they must share with the world on TikTok. There are some desensitizing activities that are more subtle, but they're recognizable because they're, they usually change the focus from God to self. The problem is that self-centeredness is <clears throat> praised as doing what is best for your mental health, for your ability to cope, and for your family. But the Bible gives us some rock-solid advice. God is love. Yeah. We cannot make or earn love. We can only inherit it through God's grace. 
Our current culture is filled with messages of self-love. Think about how often you hear mom say, I need some me time. There's nothing wrong with wanting to be alone sometimes or needing peace or some time to do something that is not centered around your children or work or marriage or school. When my kids were young, I needed me time. So my sister and I started doing yoga. We were pretty naive about it at the time. We knew our gram said that it was new age and we should stay away from that new age stuff. It invites the devil into your mind. But what does that mean? I, I had no idea. Yoga is ancient and there are many studies which show it to be relaxing and beneficial for your physical and mental health. We loved it. I don't think I have personally ever felt better in my life. I was stronger, more flexible, more chill, more at peace, and nothing ached or hurt. When they told us to send our energy out into the universe, I prayed instead, thinking that I was protecting myself from the new age part of it. But I clearly heard what they said because I just repeated it to you. I thought about what they meant about sending my energy out into the universe and imagined it occasionally, and that was the point. I participated even though I thought I was avoiding it. I was avoiding the dangerous part, right? We left there feeling so happy and relaxed and revitalized, neither of us had any idea that we were doing poses which honored other gods or that we were allowing it to get into our psyche. There are so many ways that we're being desensitized, and I'll only give one more example, though it is a real whopper. In September, my husband and I took a vacation with our granddaughter. Flying out of Boston, we were asked to provide ID for each member of our party, and those were the exact words, I need ID for each member of your party. So Dave handed them his license, I handed them my license, and tried handing them Z's birth certificate, as we've always had to do in the past. The TSA agent put his hands in the air like it was toxic. What is that? Is that for the child? He actually like physically recoiled from it. I said, yes, you need her ID, right? He said, no. And I stared at him like dumbfounded until he finally said, what's her name? I told her, him her first name, that's all, no last name, no explanation of our relationship, our intentions, or why her mother wasn't present. Nothing at all. He said thanks and sent us on our way as quickly as he could. It was bizarre. Both of us were like, what just happened? On the way back, I tried handing TSA her birth certificate again. She didn't take it either. So I said, do you need to know who she is? And she looked at her and she said, what's your name? She said her first name. The TSA said, okay, go ahead. <laughs> I, uh, shocking. They didn't even want to know whether a child was traveling with the permission of her parents. They didn't care whether her information even matched up with that on our tickets. They were not even gonna ask her name until I made them feel like they had to. This made me think of the number 291,000, but I'm gonna take a scenic route to explain what 291,000 has to do with TSA and our granddaughter. I'm gonna use a code word now, being because I respect our children too much to actually use the word. And I just don't wanna say it in the house of God, but we all know that this word encompasses much more than the obscene images you scroll past on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, or Facebook. Our society believes that watching pop-up ads is 100% normal and even healthy. It may start out as a simple scrolling through your social media feed and suddenly, whoa. Next thing you know, you're seeing things you wouldn't have thought of on your own accord. If you were doing something useful, like, you know, laundry, that wouldn't have popped into your head. Let's look at what pop-up ad, pop ads are. On a personal level, pop-up ads are the way to achieve a moment of happiness without putting any effort into fostering a personal relationship with another human being. For unmarried people, that means that instead of fine-tuning your interpersonal skills and seeking out someone who shares values and faith in God, you go home, you get a short-term, instant feeling of gratification, which leaves us quickly, leaves as quickly as it was gained. 
You're left with a feeling of loneliness and continued alienation from what you truly need, a human connection with someone you love and have built a relationship with. I am absolutely not implying that this is simple or even always possible to find this intimacy. It is so very complicated finding someone you share values with. I'm simply saying that it's what we were designed for. For married people, that means that instead of repairing or maintaining the connection with your spouse, you're taking the easy way out. You're re relieving yourself of the weighty task of fixing your personal shortcomings, forgiving those of your spouse, and turning to God for the strength to do it. You're taking the three-minute high, which is inevitably followed by more marital misery. For our society in general, that means we're watching broken and hurt people objectify themselves for complete strangers. Pop-up ads contributes to the slavery, traffic, and exploitation of other human beings, which includes young people barely out of childhood assuming it was technically legally produced and marketed, and to actual children if it was not. America is the greatest consumer of child pop-up ads in the world. Children are being stolen and unforgivably, unforgivably, unforgivably abused every single day to gratify the insatiable lust of Americans here home. Of the 448,000 unaccompanied children transferred by ICE into Health and Human Services custody, that's 448,000 children allowed to cross into our border without a parent or guardian. Of those, 32,000 failed to appear for their court dates. So the Department of Homeland Security Inspector General did an investigation. The final report was issued August 19, 2024. That's this summer. I've asked Uncle Mick to post this study and related news article to, on the bulletin board in the hallway. So please go look at it if you, so that you cannot think that I'm biased or skewing data. In this DHS study, they found that they were never that those that they never even assigned court dates to 291,000 children. That's three quarters of the children who were unaccompanied, never even received a date to appear in court. So that 32,000 that didn't show up, we we're lucky to even have that on the radar. ICE has received no location information for them, and they have no idea if they are safe from trafficking, exploitation, or slave labor. We have not been able to contact these children after they were released to health and human services from the border protection agencies. Let that sink in. This is what keeps me from sleeping. 291,000 children we're responsible for have been sent out into the country, and we don't even know where they are. And TSA did not want to know my granddaughter's name, our relationship to her, or why was that even the ticket that we bought for? for a, was she even the child that we bought the ticket for? I first learned about the missing children from the news, which won't even look into where these children have gone. If you want the truth, you can't just glance at headlines. Most of the headlines of this study just said 31,000 children, but that only tells the number of kids who never appeared to their court date. It doesn't include the numbers that have not even received a court date and we have no idea about. Even worse, many articles tried to make it sound like it was just a clerical error which didn't matter or a conspiracy theory that should be disregarded altogether. They intentionally make the headlines misleading because they know that we don't wanna to dig too deep. So we'll just read the little bit that they want us to take away from the article, whether it's true or not. And so many of the new articles frame it the same way. If you only read the headline and don't read it critically, you start thinking there were only 31,000 children that they temporarily lost location for. Don't even ask me how 31,000 is an acceptable number. Repeating a lie is still a lie. It doesn't become true simply because it's repeated so often that we can't remember anything else. There are so many more topics I could cover that we're being desensitized in and we never even notice. This could be a very, very long sermon. Once you start to look for ways that you're being desensitized to stray away from God's path, you see it everywhere. 
I've just tried to cover some of the more covert ways. Think of buying a dress from Timu for $1.73, made in a third world country half a world away, shipped here direct to you in no time at all, but it's a legitimate company, right? Everybody uses it. I'm just bargain shopping. I'm being frugal with, in these fiscally hard times. Turning a blind eye to something does not make it okay. Buying that dress is clearly supporting slavery and child labor. Nothing else. It is not a financial bargain. It is a bargain with the devil to benefit those who are benefit off of those who are vulnerable. But really, we need to know where all the, of this is leading. We have faith that God will take care of those who harm his little one. Praise God. And we know that this will happen leading up to his return. I do realize that this sermon has been odd and ramble to unorthodox areas in their lives. And I know that in my home church where they see me all the time and they know my personality and know that this is a very unusual sermon for me to give, it probably is a little bit more impactful. But my point is simply this. I've just come home to visit my family. They've prayed for my safe arrival. They've cleaned their house. They've made my bed. They've prepared a meal. We have the most important date of our lives approaching. Have we been praying, preparing, and watching, cleaning up our own messes, and putting our hearts and minds and lives in order? Or have we been ignoring the degradation of our society and the signs that are so clear? Are we participating in it? Are our children's priorities in their proper order? Is our focus where it should be? Are we digging into his word as deeply as we are into the internet? Ezekiel 11, 17 to 21 says, This is what the sovereign Lord says. I will gather you from the nations and bring you back from the countries where you have been scattered. And I will give you back the land of Israel again. They will return to it and remove all its vile images and detestable idols. I will give them an undivided heart and put in them a new spirit. I will remove from them their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. Then they will follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. They will be my people and I will be their God. But as for those whose hearts are devoted to their vile images and detestable idols, I will bring down on their own heads what they have done, declares the sovereign Lord. And as Jeremiah asks in chapter 5, verse 31, what will you do in the end? Let's bow our heads. Father, we are weak. We don't know how to live in this world, but not be of this world. We need your powerful hand to hold ours. It's so dark here. Please be our light so we can find our way out to you. Inspire us to turn to your word. We need you every day and every hour. Please hold us close in spite of our wandering. But Father, Please let us find, see the truth in the world around us. We do not want to be blind sheep. We want to be your sheep, protected and loved by the only good shepherd. We want to be yours for eternity. Make our hearts and minds worthy. In your precious name, amen. <laughs>